sugary drinks like soda are linked to an increased risk of cancer, do plant-based diets deprive the brain of an essential nutrient? By taking antibiotics, you have a high risk of developing rheumatoid arthritis. These headlines pop up on our digital screens and may catch our attention due to their startling conclusions. Today, we are living in a rapidly growing digital world, and health resources are no exception. Social media sites have become influential to our everyday medical needs and decisions. Particularly, in emotional times, we tend to turn to the digital realm around us for hope and medical answers. For me, I was in high school when my grandmother Lovejoy was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. Over the next eight years, my grandmother lost her independence, her lifetime of memories, and eventually her ability to communicate. While my family was reeling from this diagnosis, I found myself turning to the internet, seeking treatments that claimed to slow the progression of Alzheimer's disease. Each click led to another claim, a different recommendation. Because I craved certainty in research, I fell victim to the dramatic claims of medical clickbait. And maybe you too have become a victim of medical clickbait. How will we know if we're being misled by medical clickbait? What makes some claims plausible and others preliminary? <laughs> the short answer is utilizing statistical tools. <laughs> For some of you, statistics is a scary word. <laughs> it evokes memories of a class consisting of trying, maybe unsuccessfully, to conduct a one sample t-test or calculate a p-value. <laughs> While calculations are important to evaluating scientific data, the other side of statistics requires interpretation. Interpreting statistics involves an ability to judge a research finding on a spectrum of weak to strong. To effectively do so and to avoid being misled, I propose it simply starts by asking yourself a few good questions. First, let's consider these questions. Is the research claim concluding a correlation or a causation relationship? And is there another possible explanation for the variables correlating so well? Let's say one day you're scrolling through your favorite healthcare website like WebMD, <laughs> when you read sugary drinks like soda are linked to an increased risk of cancer. Wait, what? Click. The study concludes that drinking just a third of a can of soda daily increases your overall risk of cancer. As you're sitting there, you may be wondering, can this be true? Before I answer, let me walk through some commonly misunderstood and misused terms, correlation and causation. Correlation is a measure of relation between two things, which gives us an idea of how strong a relationship is. Generally, observational studies show correlation, but could be causal under some circumstances. For instance, what if I claimed that the consumption of the cafeteria chocolate chip cookies led to more students applying to Austin College? <laughs> Does this mean if Austin College had a low application rate, it's due to the prospect students not having one of those delicious chocolate chip cookies? The mistake occurs when one implies causation when the data shows correlation. Remember that causation refers to one event happening because of another. So I ask again, does the consumption of chocolate chip cookies cause students to apply to Austin College more? Maybe, they got me. <laughs> Therefore, it is important to identify what type of relationship you have come across. So going back to the original claim, sugary drinks like soda are linked to an increased risk of cancer. Raise your hand if you think this is a correlation relationship. Okay. Now raise your hand if you think this is a causal relationship. 
Okay. And how many just want a chocolate chip cookie? <laughs> yes. While this claim may appear to be false, this example was motivated by a real example that I found over the summer. In the article, the authors mentioned that although past research supported this claim, they could not determine causality. Hence, we have just a strong correlation relationship. The next question you could ask yourself is, is there another possible explanation for the variables correlating so well? This type of question entails some deeper thought and research. Maybe the sugar from the soda affects the visceral fat, blood sugar, or inflammatory markers, which in turn increases the risk of cancer. Or maybe there's a more complicated set of relationships that have not yet been explored. Or the correlation could just be a coincidence, a phenomenon where the numbers just happen to be closely related. Despite your educational training, you can identify what type of relationship and weigh the strength of evidence using these two questions. Now, let's consider a second set of questions. How was the data collected, and who does the sample represent? We use statistics to make a general conclusion about the population from limited data. Researchers must obtain a representative group of individuals that closely resemble the important characteristics of the target population. Otherwise, the results may not apply to all people. Know that the final results of the study will be impacted by the sampling method chosen and the people collected in the initial stages of the study. For instance, let's say I'm interested in knowing some nutritional statistics about the United States. I need a sample, and <laughs> lucky for me, you're all sitting right here. Let's do a survey. Okay, who here has had any kind of fast food in the last year? <laughs> Woo! Looks to be about, well, I'll say 90%. Okay, next question. Who here has taken any vitamin C in the last year? Okay, it looks to be about 70%. So we will make two conclusions. Last year, 90% of Americans ate fast food as a part of their diet, and about 70% consumed vitamin C as a supplement. While these claims may appear to be true, let's go through the questions. How was the data collected, and who does the sample represent? Even if you know nothing about sampling methods, you observe that I conveniently sampled from the people in this room. Who are the people in this room? It looks to be highly educated, well-nourished, and a wide age group of individuals. So why wouldn't this sample be good enough to represent the average American? After all, aren't Texans the best kind of Americans? <laughs> because I conveniently sampled from the people in this room, not everyone in the United States had the opportunity to get chosen. Unfortunately, this means my conclusions are affected by sampling bias. Secondly, the makeup of the sample is relevant because it pertains to our original question of interest. Do we represent all racial and ethnic groups in the United States? Was the ratio of males to females equivalent to that of the nation? Did we consider important diseases like type 2 diabetes, lung cancer, or heart disease that may alter our results? In my example, it is easy to see the errors of my sampling method and the lack of representation in my small study. However, what about when it comes to reading medical articles you see every day? From journals to news articles alike, we hear things like large sample size, randomized study, or large database that never make us think twice about the sample. Let me leave you with some lasting insight. First, any sample size can have sampling bias, and two, the results may not apply to you due to who was represented in the study. It happens more often than you think. Lastly, let's consider one last question. Does the research show statistically significant and clinically significant results? <laughs> in Texas, we think of two things at the end of September, the Texas State Fair 
and flu season. <laughs> Speaking of flu, let me tell you about a fascinating new flu study. The results revealed that participants taking a new treatment called flu begun had a statistically significant reduction in flu-like symptoms without any side effects compared to those who didn't take anything at all. Is anyone interested in trying this out? Before you go running to your nearest drugstore, let's take a minute to talk about the phrase statistically significant. Statistically significant is a term we often hear in medical articles, but is commonly misunderstood. We naturally take the phrase significant to describe something important or meaningful. However, in the statistical world, we use this phrase in statistical testing when a p-value is less than some specified threshold value. In other words, it means the treatment effect is unlikely due to chance alone. That being said, it does not necessarily tell you if the treatment will have any impact in your daily life, or in a more technical term, have clinical significance. So going back to the example, what if I told you that flu be gone could reduce the number of hours you experience flu-like symptoms from three days to eight hours? Since this treatment would have a positive and noteworthy improvement for us, we call this treatment effect clinically significant. In this case, it happens to be both statistically and clinically significant. However, this is not always the case when we read medical articles. For example, the study may have statistical significance due to certain characteristics of the study, such as large sample size, large effect size, or low statistical power. Because some of those statistical concepts may be foreign to some of you, you should tread lightly when you interpret results and its impactfulness. To critically analyze the strength of evidence then, search for the research article, which mentions the clinical impactfulness and its limitations. As a takeaway, statistical significance does not necessarily mean the treatment will have any effect in your daily life. To conclude, given the vast digital mediums to access medically related data, it is essential to take the time to critically analyze each piece of published evidence. First, ask yourself, is the research claim concluding a correlation or a causal relationship? And is there another possible explanation for the variables correlating so well? Secondly, ask yourself, how is the data collected? And who does the sample represent? Lastly, ask yourself, does the research show statistically significant and clinically significant results? This can create a conversation between you and your friends, family, doctor, maybe even your first date. My hope for everyone listening is that if monstrous diseases happen in your life, you will have the tools to navigate medical clickbait online. Each one of you has the ability to read, question, and think beyond the medical headlines. And it starts with asking a few good questions. Thank you. <laughs>